Good afternoon, and welcome all. In an ideal world, we'd all be gathering in person. And much like the game of golf itself, we'd be drawing off the unique energy that comes from experiencing a shared sense of community. Operating remotely, I'm excited for what the coming days have in store. I feel confident that we'll be able to authentically create a similar sense of unity, positivity, strength, and spirit that would otherwise come from us all being together and in person. Thank you to the National Links Trust for leading and driving this inaugural Municipal Golf Symposium. My name is Dave Aznavorian. I am the Senior Director of Transformational Initiatives at the United States Golf Association. If you're anything like me, you might actually be wondering what that title means. I know I certainly did when my role was created a few short years ago. We'll hold on to that thought for a minute, and we'll come back to it. Many of you, like me, are the byproduct of a municipal golf course upbringing. My first and second generation Armenian parents were not golfers. I didn't come from a legacy of golfers. I liked sports and was competitive, and it became pretty apparent pretty early on that a career in football or baseball or hockey wasn't going to be in the cards for me. When I was 13, my dad spotted an ad in the local newspaper for a week of junior golf lessons at the Muni near my childhood home. The week of advertised lessons cost $25. A few weeks later, I threw the five clubs I'd inherited from my grandmother, wooden laminated steel shafted mashies, in the back of my dad's Buick station wagon, got dropped off at the local Muni with a pack of cheese and crackers and a Capri Sun, and was then formally introduced to the game of golf. My experience was highlighted by a motivated instructor, a pool of kids I found pretty fun to hang out with who, like me, seemed to enjoy a pretty good hot dog. There were range balls, a driving range, a practice green, and two 18-hole golf courses I could play for $3 a day, as much as I wanted, and I did, sometimes finding a way to play as many as 54 holes on longer summer days. My story isn't too unlike many others that discovered this great game. At the Muni, I would watch the way a group of regulars would talk about new grips or stances or backswings, or discuss trends in the game, or give each other a hard time, or engage in more deep conversations about life. All of that played out for me at my local municipal golf course. That experience led me into caddying. Caddying led me to volunteering, and volunteering led me to working my first US Open conducted by the United States Golf Association. The US Open at the Country Club in Brookline, Massachusetts in 1988, one of the five founding clubs of the USGA, and where the 122nd US Open will be played once again next June. My journey was transformed by municipal golf. I owe a lot to it, and I believe that many of us do. And so, it ultimately made a bit more sense to me when it came about trying to understand the title Transformational Initiatives. As I thought about my own personal journey and how the initiative brought forth by my dad opening the morning newspaper ultimately allowed me to be personally transformed by golf. The bigger question today as we kick things off and look out over the expanse of what's on our agenda over the next two days is this. What is the major transformational initiative today with respect to municipal golf that we all want to get behind? In looking at what we'll be covering, architecture, growing the game, sustainability, community impact, programming, community partnerships, how do all of these themes move forward singly, but also join together to contribute to the invigoration and resonance of municipal golf as a transformational initiative within and on behalf of the greater game. So for a moment, let's take a step back. Let's go back just over 100 years to be exact. As you know, sometimes there's value in looking back to look forward. So let's go back for a moment and think about municipal golf's history, arc, and evolution in the United States. Golf was introduced to the US in the early 1700s and established a firm foothold by the late 1870s, the game experiencing an incredible growth spurt from the early 1890s to 1930. Who America was as a country at that time 
how we prioritize growth and expansion largely explains the evolution of golf. The U.S. was experiencing a great migration of people from the cities, where they principally worked, to the countryside. Public parks and green spaces were critical to methodical and thoughtful urban and suburban development and grew as an outcome of industrialization when everybody just needed a little fresh air. Outdoor sports and recreation were not so much looked upon as not working, but instead a healthy, affordable way to balance precious off time from the centers of industry of the day, largely mills and factories. Around this time, Saturdays were converted to half holidays, giving friends and families more time to be together, and the middle class in America thereby continued to grow. Municipal golf emerged from and thrived off this very energy. Perhaps there's no better example than what happened in New York City and Central Park around this time. Van Cortlandt Park was established as a nine-hole layout in 1896 by the city's park commissioner and is widely regarded as America's first municipal golf course. Green fees were actually free. Thursdays were established as ladies' days. And although the conditions weren't always ideal, a local reporter would later claim it was the recruiting ground for more followers of the game than any other golf course in the country. Blue collar and even no collar workers, writers, starving artists, and actors all felt comfortable gathering together to play a round of golf at night before then heading into work. Around this time, the New York Times reported that there were so many people playing golf at Van Cortlandt Park on holidays and weekends, with so many balls flying around in so many different directions, that it was putting many on the grounds at incredible physical risk. By 1914, a season's golf permit was $1, and 6,600 golfers signed up. The turn of the century golf boom caught on, and other cities looked and took notice. Cities like Boston and Chicago started to use public land for America's newly emerging or other favorite pastime. Public golf courses were touted as being just as essential to city and town infrastructure as public libraries. Municipalities believed these courses, much like the park system, were built to promote equality, to promote public health, and to offer affordable or even free recreation. Pittsburgh's public golf course at the time proclaimed most notably, anyone making $2 was just as welcomed as any millionaire. By 1913, there were 63 municipal golf courses in America, many of them nine-hole tracks. By 1917, Chicago's two municipal golf courses welcomed 364,000 golfers in one windswept, cold-shortened season. A major growth spurt for municipal golf kicked off just after World War I. As a reaction to the war, fitness was prioritized as a matter of U.S. national security policy. And, above and beyond golf, it also marked a great era for park building in general across the United States. In 1922, recognizing its emergence, the USGA would establish a dedicated national championship, the U.S. Amateur Publinks, both acknowledging and looking to further spur the game's growth. The championship may have been the headline, but the announcement was arguably more importantly marked by a commitment from the USGA to advocate for the interests of public golf and support the new development of golf courses. So popular was the golf movement at the time that President Harding donated a trophy for a national inner city team annual championship proclaiming a victor among municipal golf cities all across America. A Yale sports writer penned that every American was due the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of golf balls. I'm actually serious. You can't make that up. Hundreds of municipally owned and operated golf courses across America sprung to life in the roaring 20s, from Philadelphia to Oregon, from Ohio to Iowa, and throughout the Southeast. For whatever the reason, not everyone could see themselves playing football or baseball or hockey, but they could see themselves playing golf. As it grew to scale, 
Golf course management and maintenance evolved from art to science around this same time. It just so happened that as more people played and courses sorted through how to manage foot traffic, it also meant prioritizing decent playing conditions in order to keep up. The USGA, as many of you know, founded the green section around this same time, just over 100 years ago, in fact, and notably in Washington, D.C., along with experts from the Department of Agriculture who served at its founders, and with Arlington serving as a prominent turfgrass research center for decades. Founded in 1920, the green section was created to help allow critical green spaces to thrive and be healthy by offering free, practical expertise and university-led research to ensure golf courses, most notably in the area of maintenance, could get the expertise, insight, and help they needed. Under the simple mantra the group operated, better turf at better lower costs. Fast forward a little to the formative years following the Great Depression, which led to another surge in affordable municipal golf for the masses. Through the WPA, new golf courses were built. Many municipal golf courses in need of course maintenance help provided emergency relief work through the CCC, PWA, as well as the WPA, as the country slowly got back on its feet. In reviewing the 1927 U.S. Open program played at Oakmont Country Club, the USGA reported that there were 148 cities in America managing more than 200 municipal golf courses with an average green fee of 25 cents for 18 holes. The report shared that despite rumors to the contrary, most of these municipal golf courses were entirely self-sustaining. By 1930, nearly all munis charged something for public golf to help defray their maintenance costs. Sadly, in many cases, that revenue was often deferred to other municipal projects and not put back to supporting the golf courses themselves. Land increasingly became a valued commodity and population growth led to some municipalities having to make some rather hard decisions. This is where the rise of semi-private and daily fee golf courses began to grow. As the supply demand curve got a little thrown off and municipal courses became overrun with avid golfers who suddenly had no place to play. The new courses charged more money, opened to fewer golfers to control their pace of play and managed things like turf health much more prescriptively. As year over year, wealth returned to the country, so too did a burgeoning upper class and commensurately the rise of private, resort, and real estate development-based golf courses. Today in America, 2,900 municipal golf courses have stemmed from that century-old movement. There are 8,900 daily fee courses and 4,300 private courses. Public golf accounts for around 75% of the more than 16,000 courses in America. Oddly enough, many of these precious municipal gems and several of the ones that followed are in the same peril as they were 100 years ago. Inventively and creatively, municipalities have sought public-private partnerships to generate revenue for much needed capital improvements. The USGA continues to provide expert course consulting visits through the green section. The requirements are a little different now and technology plays a much larger role in service delivery, but the principles upon which the green section were founded are still very much active and thriving today. Charleston Municipal Golf Course in South Carolina, built in 1929, is a great example of creative thinking. For those who may not know it or haven't played it, the course sits adjacent to a river in Charleston, and several areas of the golf course are prone to flooding. The mayor, while not a golfer, continues to see value in public green spaces and pledged $1.5 million in bonds with his For Y'all private funding campaign that helped to raise the second half. Opening this past fall, the venue now has two much larger ponds on the premises that not only offer sources of water for irrigation, but also offer the community a critical outlet for stormwater runoff. These type of win-win partnerships are what municipal golf can benefit from, and at least I believe, is part of the task before us as we aim to think big 
and consider relevant and timely transformation in our game? How do we continue to explore, pursue, and cultivate these type of win-win scenarios? Above and beyond funding, munis can also continue to build learnings, hone and sharpen the experiences for the golfers who play them, from tee to green. Cranon Park, a muni based in Miami-Dade County, has specifically worked with the USGA over the past several years to prioritize and improve pace of play, with a surprise ancillary benefit coming out of engagement with USGA green section staffers. The use of GPS trackers and heat mapping technology illustrated to the county the walking patterns of golfers and where they spent the majority of time on the course. It also called out to everyone where many of the playing bottlenecks were occurring. Crandon and the county also found that they could reduce areas of managed turf grass where golfers rarely walked to help reduce costs. The results after implementing the renovations? The county now saves more than $350,000 a year in water alone. A single facility, $350,000 in savings. Those outcomes, while not easily repeatable at scale, are good for the course, good for the county, and when reinvested back into the golf course itself, good for the golfer over the long term. Many other courses and case studies are out there and can serve as inspiration. Goat Hill Park in California was a muni in peril seven years ago as the town sought to develop the valued land on which it sat. Community outcry rallied to save it, referring to it as the People's Park of Oceanside. Goat Hill has a three-hole kids course, a short course, no dress code, is dog friendly, and features a memorable motto, world class, working class. They all get it, the value of munis. Like those that have come before me at the United States Golf Association, the current generation of leaders and influencers at the USGA recognize what they all did and the initiatives that were taken to uniquely position this important sector in the game. Municipal golf is America's golf. Highlighted by what's happening with municipal golf in our nation's capital with the National Links Trust, breaking down the barriers of cost, time, race, and accessibility, these are critical examples that need to be shared, exemplified, and scaled. The National Park System recognizes the value of these courses and demonstrably public-private partnership that has helped to restore several valued gems, not only to the golf world, but also to the greater community at large. So bringing this full circle, we can each draw on our own personal experiences. We can also draw on the lessons of history and we can draw on the many case studies of success that exist, a few of which I've shared to open up our symposium. It's important, if not already obvious, to remind ourselves why we're all here and how we're all working toward the same cause. Ideally, we want to realize how our own areas of experience can be leveraged, where we can exact control, and what we can rightfully influence and how, working both independently and collaboratively, we can form a transformational initiative that enhances and elevates municipal golf in the United States. Maybe only because I've gotten used to it over the years, with a last name that ends with the letter A, I find I'm drawn to words that also start with this letter. And so, let me offer up a few framing up words for the symposium, beginning with A, as we think about how we go forward. First, activity. Municipal golf was originated in this country to get the masses out and about, into the fresh air, into the outdoors, to enjoy healthy exercise. Among many lessons that we continue to draw from the pandemic, some unfortunately quite painful, what have we learned? Well, we've learned the value of fresh air, healthy exercise, and the value of spending time with friends, being active in an easy way. Golf checks all those boxes. Municipal golf checks all those boxes and 
takes advantage of parks which provide critical green spaces in communities that continue to grow up or out around them. Municipal golf upholds one of the primary tenets of sustainability as a usable asset. Municipal courses offer many of the same attributes as city parks, stormwater runoff, biodiversity, bee pollinators, temperature reduction, but, and, municipal golf courses also welcome and embrace activity. Golfers who play on them, community members who walk on them, individuals who work at them, truly a usable, active community asset. We can't forget golf is not just a spectator sport, but one that everyone can play. Golf for many is played for the simple love of the game, for escape and for connection. It's what attracts people to the game and why so many returned in droves last year. Wellness and preventative health for our US population will become more and more of a recurring theme in the coming years. What better way for individuals who are seeking light activity and fitness close to urban centers than to experience golf on a municipal golf course. Next A, affordability. The cost to play nine or 18 holes is worth noting, and it's important not to overlook it. Families in particular often assess two major functions when considering any family activity, time and cost. How much will it cost to spend X hours of time together. The cost to play municipal golf, of course, varies depending on the market and the nature of the course itself, but averages around $30 across the US. For a family, run those numbers up against going to a baseball game, or going to the movies, or going to the mall, or heading out to dinner. Sure, there are less affordable options than golf, but Municipal golf, its value for the onboarding of new golfers, and the value of keeping its cost structure down is critical for all of us in the industry to prioritize. We talk a lot about growing the game through the demand side of the growth equation. More juniors, more instructors, more lessons. Yet there's also an important supply side of the grow the game equation, which relies not only on having municipal golf courses, around and available, but also keeping their costs and inputs, labor, water, nutrients down. As history can indicate, the growth of municipal golf slowed when maintenance costs rose and daily fee costs commensurately started to rise. We have way more recreational options today that compete for the family dollar. People, especially new golfers or groups not formally exposed to golf, through the playing of municipal golf courses, will welcome in an important next generation and help keep golf affordable for everyone. Which leads to a third and final A, accessibility. Think back to the lessons learned from history. You weren't a good city in America if you didn't have a municipal golf course 100 years ago. The Muni broke down barriers between rich and poor, male and female, and even though it took far more work and time, white and non-white. We need more affordable golf courses run by communities with community programs that welcome populations that look more like America and the changing demographics that now define it. We need better programs and more volunteers to bring in youth, women, and diverse populations. The entire golf industry is squarely behind this effort, and everyone is looking for projects that we can rally behind and support. Back to Golf in 2020 was a great example of industry collaboration. Make Golf Your Thing is now as well. Activity, affordability, and accessibility are the whys that run behind our agenda and the reasons to believe for all of us. They're the reasons why it's important to keep municipal golf alive and well for the people. At the USGA, we're thinking about how history can teach more golfers more about the value of municipal golf. We're thinking about how our championships can be held at more municipal golf courses. 
We will continue to offer grants to municipal golf courses for junior programming like First Tee. We have invested in research and new technology to help advance the game and will continue to provide course consulting services from the green section. The Natural Capital Project is the latest of many projects which shows hard and demonstrable data on the value which golf courses and green spaces provide to communities in terminology that land planners can easily understand. Golf courses help reduce heat islands. They lead to positive stormwater drainage. They provide areas for native plant materials. And they support the local ecosystem with pollinator habitats on the golf course. The model created from the application of USGA funding can be scaled to nearly any urban landscape in the country. And it's a critical piece of data to inform how green spaces can be used as population density increases. Those societal trends are what can put municipal golf courses at risk if we aren't able to show decision makers the value that they provide. We have an exciting and important opportunity ahead of us. It's important that we think about what municipal golf could look like in the next 10 years and dream big behind an integrated program that the entire game can rally behind. Our new USGA CEO has challenged me and many of us at the USGA to build big, bold leadership initiatives that can make a real difference in golf over the next 50 years. Mike Wan is ready to put resources, both human and financial, behind those very ideas. It's important that the ideas are thoughtful and inclusive, that they include a vision, that they have a strategy, that they communicate clear goals, that they have measures, that they can be monitored for progress and efficacy, that they can take wherever we are now in our current state and measurably move to a new desired better state beyond where we are today. And that in satisfying all of those criteria will then truly serve as a transformational initiative in golf. More than ever, the USGA's vision for golf is to ensure that the game thrives for the next 20, 50, even 100 years from today. Realizing that vision relies upon a healthy, welcoming, and thriving environment around municipal golf. Thank you for the opportunity to share some thoughts and perspectives. I'm excited for what the coming days and years have in store for municipal golf in the US. And on behalf of everyone at the United States Golf Association, I am excited to be part of any initiative that not only transforms the game, but more personally and individually can transform the lives of those who can and will be bettered as people by the game of golf. Thank you very much.